Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Hey there, today we're chatting with Todd Saxton, who's the VP of Business Development for the Reagan Street Institute, along with a whole bunch of other titles that we'll get into on the proper podcast. It's a great episode. I want to say thank you again to Todd for taking the time to chat with me. A uh, lot in there about healthcare, innovation, and some healthcare startups. After the episode, if you haven't already subscribed, do that and leave us a review. It sure would mean a lot. This episode is brought to you by Full Stack PEO. Most founders start companies because they figured out a better way to solve a problem or serve a need, not because they love tracking payroll, filling out compliance forms, and explaining employee benefits packages. And yet, all that stuff still has to be done. That's why there's Full Stack PEO. Full Stack PEO specializes in turnkey HR for emerging companies, not just those core services, but advice and expertise that help founders maximize employee potential. Curious? Find out more at fullstackpeo.com. Welcome to the podcast. Today we have Todd Saxton, who's a repeat guest. Todd was on the podcast maybe a year ago, maybe a little less than a year ago. He's one of the co-authors of The Titanic Effect, and there was a three-part series on The Titanic Effect that if you go back in time a little bit, uh, you should be able to find uh, Todd, Kim, and Michael, who each came on and talked about their portion of uh, that book. Today, we're talking with Todd because he's the VP of Business Development for Regan Street Institute, and I wanted to pick his brain about that. Todd is also the Associate Professor for Strategy and Entrepreneurship at the Kelly School. Todd, welcome. Hi, Mike. Thanks. Great to be here. You now have the honor of the longest intro I've ever done in this podcast. <laughs> yes. We can <laughs> I, we can drop the mic right there, right? <laughs> well done. All right. Well, tell us about Regan Streif. What is Regan Streif and uh, what do you guys do? Sure. So Regan Streif is celebrating its 50th year, uh, by the way. And Regan Streif was started by Sam Regan Streif. He was the seed funding for it 50 years ago. And Sam was the inventor of the front loading dishwasher. Uh, you may say, how did he get from that to healthcare? Well, uh, Sam made a lot of money with his invention and later in life had some issues in a healthcare system uh, that was notably devoid of any kind of technology. And Sam being an operations engineer and someone who was concerned about technology and process funded Reagan Streif to essentially bring technology to healthcare. And, and even at that time in the 60s, he was prescient enough to look at the role the computer might eventually play uh, in healthcare and more efficiently uh, delivering healthcare uh, to those who need it. So Regan Streif subsequently went on to, for example, in the 1970s, invent the first electronic health records system, which was employed for years at Ashkenazi. Uh, they have also created many of the standards for exchanging data between health systems uh, called LOINC, L-O-I-N-C, uh, and also helped start the Indiana Health Information Exchange, IHI, uh, which was one of the first and, and also is still uh, one of the largest and, and most successful in the country at sharing health data within Indiana across hospital systems. And give some examples of what the Institute does today. Sure. And, and I, I didn't really uh, specify, but uh, Reagan Streif is a not-for-profit. It is independent, but it is very closely tied to IU and for a time was actually under the Indiana University umbrella. Uh, but so by and large, Reagan Streif is a, a think tank, a research institute, uh, gets its funding primarily from NIH as well as the Reagan Streif Foundation. And its researchers do cutting edge research in several areas, health data. Uh, so that would include things like how do you capture, organize, hide data, or or uh, make it not identifiable by to for patients, so you're not disclosing health information that shouldn't be disclosed. That kind of leads to the second piece, which is decision tools. So how can clinicians use this health data to make better and faster decisions about healthcare? 
And then the third kind of leg, if you will, is health services. How can we more efficiently and effectively deliver uh, health services? How can you pair technology with those services? So those are kind of the, the different pieces that, that come together. And they are extraordinarily successful. These researchers at getting NIH funding have about a 40% plus uh, success rate. And that generates a, about 50 to $60 million of Reagan Street's budget on a yearly basis. Wow. That's pretty impressive. And then what's your role as VP of Business Development? Talk to me about that. Sure. So one of Reagan Streif's kind of core values is is impact and actually translating, as was part of Sam's initial vision, translating technology uh, and thought leadership, innovation and in health data, particularly in services, uh, to the actual practice of medicine. And the board and, and leadership a few years ago recognized that while we were excellent at the research side of things, getting great grants and doing thought leading research, not just in Indiana, but but nationally and globally, uh, there was not as much of an effort to directly impact practice. And as you can imagine, the timing from filing for a grant, getting approved, doing the research and publishing to then that kind of filtering its way into practice might be an eight to 12 year plus uh, cycle. Now, many of you in the venture world recognize that eight to 12 years from idea to success is not necessarily uh, off the horizon in terms of time timelines. Many ventures take a long time to materialize. But in terms of thought leading research that could affect practice tomorrow, having to wait for that long cycle to actually have the impact it could have uh, was something that Reagan Street wanted to address. So they brought me in in a joint appointment with the Kelly School to kind of help them think through, and this was now about a year ago, what does business development look like for Reagan Streif? And how can we kind of shorten that timeline from our research and thought leadership to practice? So if there's somebody who's listening, who's doing a, a healthcare related startup, and they want to partner with a think tank that does nothing but healthcare technology and, and solving hard problems around healthcare, how does somebody get plugged in with Regan Streif and, and what does that actually look like in practice? Excellent question and something that we're very conscious of. Interestingly, when I came into the position, my thought was that that would be our primary vehicle for contribution, was working with startups outside of Regan Streif or helping commercialize some of those ideas, whether that's through license or other partnerships or through starting the De Novo Enterprise. Uh, but as I became kind of more comfortable with the role and, and learned more about our partners, uh, what I found is that it's not just the new and small entity, but also the medium size and larger. Uh, some of our best and customers or promising leads are folks like Merck, Roche, Lilly, Cook, uh, some of the larger firms. Now, some of the smaller or startups in the healthcare arena could really use a partner that could help kind of vet some research to show that there's actual benefit or, or link their product service technology to health outcomes. And also just getting access to health systems can be a real challenge. So that's something that Reagan Streif can help with, whether it's to kind of vet or give feedback on the initial idea incorporated into research so that uh, there can be some kind of real world evidence that the idea actually works, which can allow you to get more customers, more clients, uh, but also raise money. And then also, again, partner to, to, to link you to health systems that we are, as Reagan Street, directly connected to folks like IU Health and Askenazi, uh, the VA, uh, but then also through IHI to most of the health systems throughout the state of Indiana. So there are several different dimensions that could be potential, but just kind of calling in, uh, I, I guess two things. First, recognize that that still is a long time cycle, whether that's getting grants and, and there are opportunities to partner with external entities for commercialization-oriented grants, SBIR and STTR, um, which are really ideal for these kind of partnerships, but they also take time, energy. It's just like raising money from other sources. It's not something that you can come in and, and kind of pull the switch in, in a very short order, get get the results. 
Got it. And then I know I've engaged with off and on a, a, a couple of what I would say early stage companies that I, I feel like may have spun out of Reagan Streif. Is, is that true? What, it, what does that look like? Yeah. So one of the early efforts, as I mentioned before, was to try and see where are some of these nuggets of, of ideas that have been funded through research and could have potential in practice. And some were already in process when I came in. So there's many of the ideas that we're cultivating through now. I've, I've just been trying to help facilitate the really good work that has already been done, but help translate that to something that could be spun out as a venture. So uh, two, I would like to mention, uh, one is a company called Probari. It is based on six years plus and over $30 million of funding from CMS, um, Medicaid and Medicare and Medicaid, that demonstrated value in the what's called the post-acute setting. So if you can think of, particularly for the elderly, uh, when they're discharged from the hospital after an acute incident, surgery, something like that, uh, they typically aren't able in many cases to go straight home. So they go into a facility that's a, a post-acute and covered, their expenses in many cases are covered by Medicare, at least for a period of time. But there's a high level of rehospitalization and inefficiency in that process in terms of how it's managed. Uh, so Probari, over those years, competed with many sites that were funded around the country, uh, 16 different sites, and emerged as one of the best at both preventing rehospitalization. Uh, but also in, in terms of actually shortening the stay in those post-acute settings, which is, as you can imagine, both expensive, but also can lead to additional kind of complications. So those are extremely important outcomes. Following the lapse of the grant, Probari needed a platform at the time it was uh, known as Care Revolution, needed a platform to be able to take uh, create a sustainable entity around that that involved creating some technology and and you and and others were very helpful with thinking through what that technology platform might look like uh, funding that and starting to actually land external customers and they've been able to do that they've raised three hundred thousand dollars they have two paying customers and are now in the process of building that customer pipeline and, and being able to help more people. Uh, that In that case, it was the researchers and the research team who have chosen to take on that, that path of taking the essentially protocol and the thought leadership on the research side, forming an entity around it, and, and then making a sustainable and, and externally viable business out of that. So that that's a great example and, and one that is solving a, a really important pain point in the market today for healthcare. Uh, another has kind of gone a different route and is a little earlier in its evolution, uh, but that company is called Upstrom's. And uh, Upstrom's focuses on what are called social determinants of health. So if you think about all of the things that affect our health, your health, my health, but particularly some challenged uh, kinds of populations, it's not just the disease states that we have, and those are the things that hospitals and physicians have insight into, but it's also all of the other pieces of the puzzle in terms of history, neighborhood, food and eating habits, exercise habits, all of those other things that are part of the equation of being a, a whole and healthy person. And some people need support uh, for those, whether that's social services, nutrition help, other types of counseling uh, might be financial assistance, things like that. Well, Upstrom's is a tool that helps physicians before they actually see the patient kind of diagnose, if you will, or understand what types of wraparound services is this patient likely to need. And through the decision tool that they've developed and over a couple of years of research have been able to demonstrate uh, that through the use of this tool, you can improve adherence, meaning the folks are much more likely to kind of follow through if when they walk into your office, you may even have the person, the dietitian, the health counselor, whatever, sitting there in the office with you, or at least be able to connect them directly during the time of that visit, as opposed to they leave the office with a list of here are some people or we'll follow up and, and give you a call or you know send you an email with, with contact information. So you can both shorten 
the length of time it takes to get those wraparound services, but at the same time, Im- improve the adherence or, or compliance so that these folks are actually following through, getting that help, and then having better outcomes. And if you know of folks who have, for example, diabetes or cardiovascular issues related to weight, et cetera, those are very much exacerbated by the food they have access to, uh, their health and, and lifestyle kinds of choices that are outside of traditional healthcare, but again, are, are very much part of the, the health equation. So as we transition from fee for service to value-based care, whatever that looks like, anticipating and being able to serve these other needs to reduce the overall health burden to the system is something that is really important. So Upstrom's is in current conversations with a a number of other systems to bring that decision tool to clinicians and enable better understanding and kind of mapping of those social determinants of health. So two follow-up questions. I want to make sure I I heard something right on Pravari. So I think you said 23 million invested for research. Is that about right? A little low, actually. Over 30 million invested. Over 30 million. Okay. Over that six or seven year period. Yes. I I think I'd written down 30 million and changed it because that sounded high. All right. So 30 million for research. And then they just raised 300K to, to build product and go to market. Is that right? Correct. So that's a couple of orders of magnitude off like how, like t- how common is that that the early research is you know millions and then then when it comes time to commercialization they look just like i mean 300,000 for a first product sounds like every other startup in the market right now right like how common is is that scenario so in terms of as a startup raising several hundred thousand to to kind of get through proof of concept and, and get off the ground as a new entity, uh, as, as you know, is not all that unusual. What is incredibly unusual in my experience is to have millions or even tens of millions of dollars of research in proof of concept behind you before you even kind of go to, to market externally, if you will. So it's a, a really kind of fascinating opportunity, right? Because you have real proof behind this. And and a lot of startups struggle to, one, find product market fit, and two, have credibility that the claims that there's a link to outcomes are real. And often that has to be either kind of a thought experiment or a connect the dots and we've connected the first three dots. But once we connect the, the next seven <laughs> with your funding, this is what we expect to see based on research, uh, logic, et cetera. But to have a, a kind of fully baked proof of concept where you're, you, that link to outcome has already been established is tremendous. Now, what are the challenges associated? Well, when you are going to health systems or, or nursing homes and you have grant funding to say, hey, We are going to, through our grant, come in and help you, help you provide better services, help you prevent rehospitalization. We're going to pay for the team and we're going to come in and work alongside of you as essentially kind of a player coach. As you can imagine, a lot of nursing homes are very receptive, especially when it's being sponsored and paid for by uh, CMS, that you have a lot of open doors. Well, converting those to paying customers. So I like to think of it, unfortunately, as kind of two cliffs. One, when you are paying for the delivery through your research grant, converting them to paying customers can be very hard, especially if it's been in place for years and has never been kind of worked into their budget. So both being comfortable selling it and asking them for money and them being able to provide it when they're already running pretty lean, that's one kind of cliff or challenge that these kinds of startups face that are coming off of research. The second is the funding piece. When you have six or seven years of funding and a whole team that that is being invested in with millions of dollars a year to all of a sudden kind of have that funding cliff where you have to go outside and show that you can deliver this in more of a, a real marketplace as opposed to something that has been subsidized that's in some ways kind of going back and and starting from scratch. So those components are very unusual and very different from other healthcare startups I've I've worked with to kind of have trade-offs, right? There there are some real positive aspects but also uh, some challenges to change that mindset. 
super interesting. That, and then I know you'd mentioned social determinants of health, value-based care. Talk about some of the other trends that, as you look at healthcare today, are interesting trends that Reagan Streif is either investing in or exploring from a technology perspective. So one of the big ones, I would say, is, is a combination of things. I mentioned decision tools. Well, when you have health data and electronic health records are great at kind of capturing health data, but they're not great at sharing data. They're not great at leveraging that data for care teams, the people in in the hospital, boots on the ground, and, and there's no more kind of timely opportunity for people to be aware of care team coordination than right now with the, the COVID crisis. And their ability to use that information to make judgments about patients to more effective, effectively and efficiently diagnose and treat them requires decision tools. It requires taking that health data that, that kind of sits in the, the EHR vault, if you will, uh, and be able to make sense of it and deliver those tools in real time to clinicians. So another that I, I didn't mention, another venture that that still is, is early enough to be unnamed, in fact, but if you have cardiovascular system, chest pain, something like that, and you go into the emergency department, there are about five core metrics that clinicians need to be able to access from your health record to make quick decisions. If I remember the numbers right, to get those out of most health records is something like 30 plus clicks and minutes of time to be able to make that diagnosis. Uh, researchers at Reagan Streif had put, have put together a tool that actually extracts at the click of a button. It's embedded within Cerner, so it's in the health record. You click, go get these five things, and seconds later, it's there. You, you have that data to make that diagnosis. Uh, well, in, in some cases, saving 30 clicks and saving some seconds uh, or even minutes may not be a big deal. But in in that particular scenario for some patients, that could be the difference between saving their lives. So that's an example of the kind of opportunity that now that we've invested uh, really decades uh, or at least years for many health systems in building these electronic health record systems, having this data capture now we need to go to the next level of making sense of that data and providing the tools for clinicians and care providers uh, to be able to make that diagnosis more effectively and then communicate with each other. That that actually is a, provides a segue to a great example uh, of Reagan Streif partnering with an external venture, uh, one that, that you and I know well, a company called Diagnotes, which is doing pioneering work in developing those tools for uh, team collaboration and communication. And a researcher, uh, research team really at Reagan Streif uh, has been working with them over the past months to show how the use of diagnosis can uh, improve the efficacy of decision making and, and collaboration between team members. Uh, so that's a research project funded by Reagan Streif to work with an external partner and help them demonstrate the value uh, of their, their system. So if those are some of the healthcare trends that you're looking at, what are some of the technologies that are hitting the market that you're potentially looking at? And that could be like big, large buckets like IoT or augmented reality, or, or it could be much, much more specific in terms of, you know, specific advances or, or changes that uh, innovations that, that you've seen that you could potentially see a, a bunch of new ways to leverage in the coming years. Is anything come to mind? Absolutely. I, th I think the intersection, again, of this data then with, with artificial intelligence, AI, and machine learning kinds of things. But one of the others, and, and this is really interesting, and this is a, another strategic partnership for Reagan Streif, is a company called MD Clone out of Israel. Now, for research purposes, you can use health data and real health data as long as you obviously treat it uh, carefully, et cetera. But for diagnosis, uh, you're not able to access. So if you see a patient, patient walks in, you can't run an AI algorithm on all of the other patients that are members of your, your hospital system to help you make, make a better diagnosis. So physicians are doing that largely in their heads or other, other care providers and then asking questions and going through that process of kind of triage, running additional tests, et cetera. 
Well, what MD clone does is it creates a synthetic database. So it, it's not a real database where you just strip off the names. It's actually creating a new database that almost exactly mirrors the actual database of, of a population. I think it's 99.7% accurate and, and reflective of a, a quote real database, but could put that in the hands of a clinician making an assessment so that essentially if you come in with a set of symptoms or or some kind of preliminary diagnosis, you could create the synthetic database. And, and this is, again, a few clicks, a few steps, as opposed to weeks or, or months of research or testing. You could create this kind of parallel synthetic database, run the patient again, saying, if I had a population of a minimum number. So let's say a thousand patients with similar symptoms, similar age, similar prognosis, et cetera. What's the best kind of course of action in terms of treatment or what are the three tests we should run first, uh, et cetera. And using MD clone synthetic database, you can, you can actually make that, that assessment again, much more quickly. Uh, so Reagan Streif is working with MD clone to one, prove that the synthetic database does really mirror the, the actual population. So uh, they have very good data within Israel on their synthetic database. We can help them kind of mirror that in Indiana and in the United States to make sure that this tool can be robust and scalable to a much larger uh, and potentially more diverse population. So those kinds of tools where you're combining use of data in, in new and interesting ways that haven't been available in the past because of partly technology and, and secondly, the lack of data capture, being able to use that data to, to again, make, make quick and informed decisions, understand how to, to pull that data. So to put subgroups of that data together in a way that is scientifically valid and then leverage that data in different ways is, is something coming back to a comment I made before that even large organizations are struggling with. Uh, someone that's really good at data science and AI uh, first can be a very expensive asset, three to four hundred thousand dollars a year or more, and part of that is because it's a relatively rare commodity. You can't just throw technology or AI at these problems and let the computer do the work to figure out how to use it. Uh, you actually have to have, particularly at this stage of, of the evolution of these technologies, a very smart human, uh, which fortunately we have have uh, many at uh, Reagan Streif who can act as that kind of interpreter and help the machine learn over time. So I know that's still a somewhat general and maybe long-winded answer to your question, Mike, but uh, just thinking through how data kind of translates to health behavior, health outcomes, and how to put those tools in the hands of, of clinicians, but also others, that's creating a whole wealth of opportunity uh, in this area of machine learning, AI, decision tools, and unique ways of organizing and leveraging data. Does Regan Streif Institute have any sort of swag? What is, uh, what is the swag of choice if I was an employee there or a researcher there? Hmm. We have a 50th anniversary t-shirt. So that that would be one that I think is cool. I think we have some other other things in development, but I'm not in on what our our final decision was as to what to offer. You're the guy out in the community shaking hands and kissing babies. You gotta have stuff to to give away. Where's the where's the Reagan Street hoodie? I, I give away Titanic books, man. Oh well, that's, I suppose that's a that's a good call on your part. <laughs> Well, one of the sponsors for the show is Fuel Merchandise Group. If you're interested in getting swag for your startup, you can head over to fuelmerchandise.com. Mention Startup Competitors for 10% uh, off your first order. And uh, they would love to help you get your 50th anniversary t-shirts, or they can help you get smaller, cool things to hand out when you're out in the, in the wild. Excellent. Thanks to them. I neglected to ask some of my early questions that I would typically ask a startup founder, mostly because this is kind of a, a little bit of a different episode, but maybe it would be helpful. How big is Reagan Streif? Maybe in terms of annual funding, if you can share that, but more interested in like the, the team size and makeup and, and things like that, just to get an idea of 
kind of scope and in, in what you and the team can accomplish in a year? Sure. Well, I'll start with age, as I mentioned before, of 50 years old. So certainly not a young or new organization. In terms of funding, I mentioned 50 to 60 million a year in NIH funding. Some of that goes for overhead. So it's filtered to other parts of the system like IU Health, for example. Most of the appointments within Regenstrief are dual appointments, many with IU Health, some with Fairbanks. So they are people that wear kind of two different hats, one a more practical or, or clinical role or research role at part of IU or, or part of the local health uh, kind of community. That kind of gives you a little bit of sense of dollars in terms of teams. And, and I think I have at least in terms of order of magnitude, the numbers right, that there are about 60 to 70 researchers who kind of fall under that that bucket. They're joint appointments, but they're they're largely dedicated to Regenstrief and do a lot of their work through Regenstrief. And another uh, uh, about that same number of kind of affiliates, people who have some kind of connection to Regenstrief, but are more, uh, I, I guess you might call it uh, pinch hitters uh, coming in on specific assignments or, or projects, uh, but still with a direct connection. Uh, and then there's about that number in staff. So a fairly sizable organization, again, pretty established. What's relatively new is this business development function of a great colleague, uh, Chris Frederick, who is full-time and is our director of strategic partnerships. So he does a lot of that work with both new, but also larger organizations figuring how, out how we can partner for those functions. What's very interesting, it, you didn't ask this question per se, but it, it might be coming up next, so maybe I'm anticipating, is that how you kind of measure success when you have largely been looking at research, research budgets, grants landed, dollars in funding, those kinds of metrics. And now with this new function, you're looking at investing in things that might take years, uh, maybe maybe more than a decade before you actually start to see payoffs. So Regenstrief, to its credit, has been willing to step up and provide some seed funding for these ideas, including Probari and including Upstroms, to kind of help get that early momentum. And they're investing for equity, so they have an, an upside in the success, hopefully, of, of those organizations. But that's going to take a very long time, and you can't kind of point to – a grant that was awarded in 2020 based on investment made in late 2019, um, you're, you're seeding something that has a much longer tail in terms of payback as, as you and your audience likely understands. Um, but in a not-for-profit setting where your budget and, and allocation decisions over decades really has been rooted in kind of different models of metrics and different views of of success and what that looks like that's probably been you know one of the bigger challenges not because they're not receptive it's just a new way of thinking about business problems and opportunities that that has a different set of metrics than has uh, typically been deployed and and I don't think Regenstrief is unusual in that right i i u uh, e even purdue which which does a lot of commercial activity and certainly even larger organizations struggle with with some of those same kind of challenges is in this very different world of startups and, and creating new things. How do we allocate budget? How do we allocate people? How do we measure success? How do we convince our stakeholders to be patient? Uh, because it's it's going to have a very different time horizon than uh, we're all used to, to thinking about. Do you ever talk to any other corporate venture capital partners or people running, you know, CVC programs inside of, I'm thinking like ridiculously large companies like Caterpillar or Chicago Mercantile Exchange or something like that. I, I've met a few of those folks and it sounds like they very much struggle with some of those same things that you just rattled off in terms of how do you distinguish between what's an actual investment you know, and, and the time horizon of that investment for a company that large, in their case, you know, publicly traded, and in your case, being a not-for-profit, where I'm, I'm sure you have some similar pressures from a funding perspective that a long-term investment may not always feel like necessarily the right call. But uh, do you ever talk to those folks? And, and if so, how do those conversations go? Is it as similar in reality as, as it might be in my head? 
It is un- unfortunately and, and sadly a, a great kind of example of that. And this was almost a year ago. It was around the time I was starting this position. And I was able to connect with a person who had been the chief innovation officer at a globally recognized health system that is known for its innovation. Uh, and, and obviously, I'm not going to share the name and had the opportunity to sit down. We, we were actually just outside of Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, able to connect with this person and and have lunch and kind of talk through. And I was so eager for the 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 wisdom and learning and and how how do you do this right? Because clearly you must have. And she made it very <laughs> clear very early <laughs> that she didn't have the answers. That this organization still really struggles, and that's you know part of why. Uh, she's not there anymore. And, and uh, it's almost startling how similar the challenges are, both at the individual level, at the team level, and, and then at the organizational and stakeholder level, like boards, uh, how parallel the challenges are. And, and if nothing else, it reinforces to me, this is why we need a vibrant startup community, because big companies, whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit, aren't necessarily good at or better at addressing all these challenges, uh, despite the plethora of resources they might have at their disposal. Interesting. Just a a super quick aside, are you familiar with the Project North program that Generator puts on? Yes. uh, You you actually were the source of my knowledge about that and uh, always appreciate that. The, The other thing I should definitely say is, those challenges are why larger organizations should work with partners like Developer Town, who can help you manage that innovation through external eyes, but still be very much part of the team. Oh, shucks. Appreciate the plug. <laughs> Thanks, man. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about like a day in the life. What does it actually look like to be a VP of business development in an organization like Reagan Streif? Hmm. Well, it's typically, uh, technically, it's interesting you say a day. Uh, technically, my appointment is one day a week at Reagan Streif because of all the other hats I, I wear at Kelly. And uh, in terms of bandwidth, when I'm kind of fully deployed at Kelly, th- that even that it can be a challenge, but but certainly make the, the time for it because I think it's a very worthwhile effort. And I... I I'm so impressed with the the people there, the researchers, the staff, their dedication uh, to bringing technology and bringing innovation to to healthcare, and they're just brilliant folks. and And I know you get to work with a lot of smart people, and we're both in places where I think not just the people we work with, but people we interact with, are, are just inspiring. Right? I mean, they're just fun and inspiring to to be around and work with, and and hopefully help. So most of my activity, and I'll kind of break it down in a few different buckets. Uh, One is that innovation hat, and about half of that is working internally with either researchers, folks like the Barbari or or the uh, Upstrom's teams, helping them think through how to move forward productively and essentially kind of acting as chief strategy officer uh, for those evolving ventures or encouraging ventures that are, are a little bit earlier, but kind of venture curious, uh, encouraging them through that process of, of what does that look like. The other half of that innovation side is working with those external organizations, folks like Diagnotes, uh, to try and help them understand how can we partner with Reagan Streif and for, for kind of a win-win, mutually beneficial uh, kind of relationship. So of uh, my typical day, One chunk of time, about a third to half is spent in those activities. To kind of support that, uh, we've set up two different kind of ongoing vehicles for socialization, for collaboration. One is more internally focused, uh, the RISE. Uh, I'm I'm an acronym guy. (laughs) So RISE is the Reagan Street Institute Startup experience, sir. I, I, I forgot the E. I can't believe I forgot the E. It's, it must be a, a function of all of this. But it's an opportunity for the folks within Reagan Streif to share their emerging concepts. I bring in some outside people for feedback, folks like yourself and, and, and early stage investors. So those RISE events are to uh, both kind of bring light to 
that innovation community within Regenstrief and connect them to outside mentors, advisors who can give them feedback as to how to proceed productively. So Upstrom's and Prabari were part of one of the early rise sessions, I believe, over the summer. Uh, and we had some some great mentors give them feedback. The other is the more of a an externally focused but pairing with inside of Reagan Street Resources, uh, and this is called the Reef. Uh, and and Reef, the idea of that is very much like a reef. That that, that a reef is a, a essentially a, a home for many different kinds of entities. Right, corals, fish, etc. Some are predators of others, but most are kind of living in this uh, ecosystem symbiotically. So Reef, the Regenstrief Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Forum, is to bring together around certain topics, people with a shared interest that typically might be two or three degrees of separation from each other. So our latest, which was focused on artificial intelligence back in December, had Reagan Street researchers who work in that area, people like Sean Granis, who again, nationally, internationally known, is a consultant to the... Uh, decision-making bodies in in Washington as to how to protect data, how to leverage data. Uh, so he was kind of the convener and and uh, moderator, but also gave a little, little talk uh, to, to help educate people on AI's role in healthcare. Uh, but then we also had some startups who came in and shared what they're working on to connect with each other. And we had large organizations. Roche came in and talked about what it's doing, how it's using data, and, and partnering with other organizations. So uh, this idea of convening, again, different different parties representing different stakeholder groups who may have very different agendas, may have different priorities, but share a passion for addressing very important problems and and hopefully can can collaborate with each other to to good effect. So organizing those kinds of activities is probably another third of of my my activity. And then the final third, which um, I, I hope I contribute to, but I, I feel like it's the least productive use of time, is just meetings, right? Representing the business development function, primarily externally, but sometimes in uh, primarily internally, but sometimes externally, and, and being present and sharing my thoughts and perspective. And I, hopefully the benefit there is kind of being from the business school and, and being to some degree, at least until recently, an outsider, I, I bring in a different way of thinking about some of the challenges and, and some of the opportunities that we're facing even today. So there's a lot of overlap in that, in kind of that day in the life description of what I would envision, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but but what I would envision the the primary kind of functions of an EIR within uh, like a, like, you know, at Elevate or uh, I think when we were doing the launch Indiana initiative and, and things like that, am I wrong about that? I mean, it sounds very much like an entrepreneur in residence kind of a thing. I would say particularly in that first third that I talked about, that's very much the case that, that kind of mentoring, cultivating, providing feedback and, uh, and then connecting, which is a very important role that an EIR entrepreneur in residence can play is in many cases, I don't know all the answers. I certainly don't pretend to, but can connect them to people in my network through the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs uh, and our Indiana chapter, particularly through our Business of Medicine program. We fortunately, and, and I have a, a really uh, bright and thoughtful network in, in health innovation and uh, can connect people who should be working together. And give me the the... 10 second elevator pitch for the business of medicine program? Uh, sure. The business of medicine is a clinician only MBA program. So it is non-specific as to specialty or location. About half of folks come from outside of Indiana, the other half from either local central Indiana or, or a little bit beyond. We have cohorts of about 40 to 45 a year, get together a little bit kind of executive style, but this, this is a full on MBA. This isn't kind of uh, lightened down in any way as, as our students and alums will will tell you. Uh, so it's over a 20, 21 month period and uh, they come in for two days a month, Friday and Saturday, once a month uh, for live interaction. And then we have some online interaction otherwise uh, to get that MBA uh, over those 21 months and and take those skills, that financial acumen, that understanding of marketing and operations back to their health systems or onto their new venture. 
Awesome. Perfect. So you have an interesting kind of tapestry of involvement. I mean, I, I know you're involved in a lot of things and I, and I know most of it stems around Kelly and, and your role there. But I mean, your role at Regan Street, very healthcare focus, business of medicine, obviously all the work you do in entrepreneurship at, at Kelly. And I, I know you're involved in a number of the kind of venture communities here in central Indiana. You and Kim, you know, did the primary push for that Titanic effect and and drug Michael along for that kicking and screaming. Like, t- talk to me about like when you reflect on kind of your role right now and everything that you're involved in. And I'm sure I'm just scratching the surface of some of the things that you're involved in. How do you think about that from a, just personally in terms of like how how does and this is a, str- a strategy question, right? How does my involvement in one thing? build on and leverage my involvement in these three other things. How do you view that personally? Because to me, that's very interesting. It's one of the things that I try to do in my life with the things that I'm involved in. And I, I think a lot of people don't really view the their professional involvement in, in maybe as a connected way as they could. And I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on how you how you've done that, whether purposeful or not, and how you think about how that continues in the future. Sure. And one, it's it's a great question, and I wish I had a silver bullet or easy answer. Uh, two, because of my enthusiasm, let's say, <laughs> I do get uh, dragged into or embrace a lot of different types of opportunities. And the downside of that or the trade-off is I am not always responsive and not as effective in some of those hats as I, I should be. And if Anybody listening to that, you're in that part of the audience that I have not <laughs> been timely at responding to, my sincere apologies, and, and I know there are many. When I think about kind of from the strategic perspective, taking on a new role, and, and I, it was a lot of, of thought going into taking on this Reagan Street role. As, as you noted, I have connections through the Business of Medicine program to both our existing students, but also alumni who are entrepreneurial, who are struggling with their own strategic challenges, particularly now. So I, that community, I was involved in helping start the Indiana chapter of SOAP in 2018, which is a, a great innovation community around healthcare, and you don't have to be a physician to be part of that organization and connected to other parts of the community through things like the Venture Club, my relationship with with people like you and, and Developer Town. And the idea of kind of putting on one more, not just really small hat, but one more pretty big and important hat at Reagan Street gave me pause in terms of my ability to continue to be successful in my role as a, a, a professor teaching and, and doing research. And what I ultimately decided, obviously, in the positive direction, is that that opportunity to connect people in these different kind of bubbles in a Venn diagram, if you will, that is something that provides unique value and also is a way to kind of synergize my my different types of activities uh, and relationships. Ultimately, my journey starting 20 years ago plus uh, started with teaching and started with my research and doing research in entrepreneurship and teaching entrepreneurship, I felt like I had to have a more grounded sense of what that actually looked like to be an effective teacher and to do research that was important, but also applicable in in kind of the real world. And and I reviewed a lot of papers and was part of writing a, a few papers where I think there was enough detachment from the reality of the entrepreneurial world that um, there wasn't translatable value even down the road to an entrepreneur, to an investor. Uh, So that really was the spark of my early activities in the venture community circa 1999, 2000. I know that makes me sound really old, right? Um, was, Was just to be a better teacher and to connect our students to the venture community, I had to start getting involved. And uh, once I I kind of started down that process, it one became, I don't want to say addictive, but but it just gave me a lot of uh, intrinsic reward to be able to connect those folks, to be able to provide a platform for our students to one, understand the theory of entrepreneurship, but also to be more practical in how they could practice that theory and actually get them to connected 
get them connected to members uh, in the community. They could help, for example, with Developer Town for a number of years. Uh, we've had those dive projects, the Discovery Innovation and Ventures Enterprise, where our evening MBA students work with startups, either within DT or uh, startups that are connected to Developer Town, and they are, they learn they're they're getting that kind of hands on experience uh, and hopefully benefit the ventures that they work with. So that's been a great partnership. That became kind of my mantra for really the last ten or fifteen years is how to kind of make meaning and and help people. Given the somewhat unique opportunity, I am I am paid full time by IU and the Kelly School. To yes, be an educator, uh, certainly deliver teaching to a number of students, and and in exchange they provide you know dollars in the forms of tuition, et cetera, uh, and to 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 do research around this area and and hopefully research that is it is grounded. But I think we collectively in in academia also have an opportunity uh, as we're trying to do at Reagan Street to kind of shorten that window of impact, not just Writing, writing papers that get out and, and then are translated into uh, thought leading practice eventually. Uh, but at least some faculty, I think, can provide that bridge from our, our thought leadership to practice. And I embrace activities that allow me to, to kind of participate in those types of activities, sometimes to a fault, as, as I said, by, by getting overloaded. I don't know if I've answer the question of how I make strategic choices uh, around the activities uh, that I engage in, but that's essentially kind of how I think about it. Awesome. Thank you. All right, man, we're way over time. I got to let you go. If people want to get in touch with you to learn more about Registry for any of the other kind of organizations or programs that you've talked about, what's the best way for them to do that? So I, I would ask you uh, before just reaching out with an email, it, it's always good to kind of check the website. So for example, Regenstreef.org uh, uh, is, a, is a great website for kind of getting a better general understanding of Regenstreef and, and what we do. But you're also welcome to reach out directly to me at tsaxton at IU, as in Indiana University, dot edu. Feel free to shoot me an email. I'm on social media. I'm on LinkedIn. Connect with me through LinkedIn. That's really a good starting point. That way, I have a frame of reference about who you are. If you want to learn more about the Titanic Effect, we have a website for that, titanicaffect.com. And uh, that's the the book, but it's also a set of tools for entrepreneurs, a weekly blog. And uh, subscribe to that, and you'll get weekly updates on our thoughts about how we translate our research and our teaching in entrepreneurship, in marketing, uh, in startups to some tips uh, for, for ways you can move forward. And certainly I'm on IU's website under the Kelly School uh, if you want to learn more about the Kelly School or my role there. So hopefully that covers it. Awesome. Todd, thank you so much. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.